You got to know when to hold them. Know when to fold them. Know <laughs> when to walk away. <laughs> Ipe, know when to run. Yeah, don't get... Ipe, uh, that run. is That is not going away anytime soon. We'll get into that later in the discussion, the Shohei Otani. No. Uh, hey, by the way, Griff, I because I sprung that on you. I actually started singing it off air when we were talking, but I didn't uh, let you in on my plan to <laughs> sing. Can I hold? Can I hold a note or not? I Just would be honest. No. I would say no. No. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not. I can't change careers, careers. to become a, a vocalist. It might. Particular I don't know. You might a roadhouse near Halifax. You might be able to get away with it. <laughs> Go up to Sackville, Lower <laughs> Sackville, and maybe, uh, maybe, maybe karaoke night. Maybe karaoke night. Uh, it's go. episode twelve of the second season of the Exit Philosophy Podcast. Rich Griffin, Scott MacArthur, coming to you from different parts of the country. Griff, of course, is in beautiful, lovely Oakville, Ontario, Canada, and as you can see by my background, it looks very hotely. If you are watching on youtube.com slash exit philosophy, and the reason it looks very hotelly is because it is. I am making the trek back for Easter and some family and friends visits, and I am in Moncton, New Brunswick on this, the night of Monday, March the 25th, and we're recording a little later in the day, not because I was en route to Moncton, because we didn't want to miss Kevin Gosman's start in what will be his only and final grapefruit league action uh, before the regular season begins griff one question before we get into that discussion uh on your way to moncton did you drive through millville at all or was there an exit for millville new brunswick millville new brunswick uh, i spent C one whole summer working there driving spikes for the extra gang for the cp railroad i spent a summer in millville with the uh, with the railroad gang, it was like the the jets and the sharks. It was the mill workers and the and the and the extra gang, the railroad gang. It was quite the scene. I'm trying to come up with the the line that <laughs> that that's the same as when Kramer was hosting on the Merv Griffin set in his apartment, and somebody brought up El Paso, and he goes El Paso. I spent a month there one night. <laughs> I said, that's pretty Millville, good. Millville, Millville, I spent a few months there one year. I spent a year there one a few months. No, it's not going to work. Not going to work. Anyway, everything comes back to a Seinfeld reference, including Ipe and Kramer making bets on which planes are going to land and take off next <laughs> at the airport. No, nah, we'll get in. But we'll get into that a little bit later on. Griff, you know. We were talking and I usually, pitching. We're talking pitching here. You and I usually record around lunchtime on a Monday. And we were talking this morning, going, hey, you know what? Why would we do that when Kevin Gosman is going to take the mound here in a couple of hours and we're going to find out what it looks like? Now there are different layers to this. Gosman missed almost all of spring in terms of grapefruit league action with shoulder fatigue and a little bit of pain but he's down there in Bradenton today as the Jays are taking on the Pirates and he strikes out seven in three plus innings and he looks great so layer number one and maybe the most significant layer passed with a big thumbs up now got to wake up on Tuesday and feel good if that happens and he threw 50 plus pitches if that happens I don't see why they wouldn't have him open the second series of the year in Houston on a pretty strict pitch count. Yeah, there's two things. I mean, he threw 52 pitches, so he can realistically get up to uh, 70 or 75 pitches if he starts that game in Houston. And it's a big game. You don't want uh, Bowden Francis starting the home opener for the Astros in a big situation in his first sort of real assignment for the Blue Jays. But the thing about that's encouraging about the Gosman situation is that he chose to go and pitch a grapefruit league game, which means that he was confident that if they had to IL him, they couldn't backdate it. He didn't, he, he didn't even think of being backdated and neither did the blue Jays. I mean, that would have been important. 
uh, if he wasn't going to come out of it well. And for those who suggest that how can he start a game in the major leagues uh, five days into the season when he's only pitched one game um, in the Grapefruit League? The fact is that these guys work at the complex. It's not in a Grapefruit League game, but they throw regularly. They throw a certain number of prescribed pitches. The only thing they don't get is the atmosphere and the pitch clock and all the rules and, and just getting into the major league scene. And that's what Gosman wanted to do with his start on Monday afternoon. Um, so it looks good for him. I would definitely, like if you start Bowden Francis on the Sunday uh, in Tampa, it allows um, Brian Servan to catch that game because you, you're not going to have uh, Alejandro Kirk catching every day. He figured it out that in the first 27 games of the season, you could have Servan catch seven times, uh, which would be day games after night games or night games before day games, depending on who you want him to catch plus catching Francis regularly if if that works out. So it work, it's workable. Servan is a decent defensive catcher with uh, led the team in RBIs this spring with 12, uh, which was kind of fluky, but you're not asking him to produce that type of offense. And, and it just works out really well for Gosman to pitch that first game in Houston and then – you know, there's a, after that, there's a couple of off days where you can set your rotation up the way you want. But right. uh, it's great to see that Gosman comes out of it. I don't think it should be held against him pitching just one Grapefruit League game because, like we said, uh, he did a lot of his work at the player development complex out of uh, out of the limelight. All right. And 26 man roster, you're, you're going to have 13 and 13. There's always this debate or notion about 13 and 13, 13 position players, 13 pitchers, or should it be 14, 12? It's it's almost always 13 and 13 now, Griff, and it definitely has to be this year because, I mean, Gosman's on a pitch count, right? And, and yeah, 75 you, you pitches. Can't, you can't go more than 13 pitchers. That That's mandatory. Right. Right, so, but no, 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 but I'm saying 14 position, 12 pitchers, yeah, 15. Yeah. But yeah. the the situation with Gosman is is he gonna he's gonna be on a strict pitch count? They're gonna manage this. I mean, this guy threw a, who, who has thrown a lot of innings over the last couple of years. Um, he is um, considered a, a pretty consistent guy, um, but you want to manage this up properly so that there are no setbacks and you don't lose him for a couple of weeks or lose him for a month. And remember, anytime some arm soreness or fatigue comes into play and you've got to shut a guy down, even if it's for a week, there's a buildup that has to take place to get him back. So you don't want to get into a situation where he's got to shut it down and not throw a baseball for another couple of weeks at some point, because then that's going to total about a month of, of time lost. So they've got to manage that. Then you've also got a guy like Bowden Francis who, I mean, looked good last year, Griff, but there are still as many or more questions than there are answers about him. And with Francis, your four, and Gosman, your five, in the initial setup here, there are going to be a lot of innings for relief well, pitchers out of yeah. the game. Yeah, and, and that's exactly why with uh, Jordan Romano and Eric Swanson being uh, sort of expected to be on the IL going into the season, why you replace them with uh, with guys that can give you length because Bowden Francis and Gosman, if they're going back to back, you might need a guy for each of those. So here you got uh, Mitch White, who's had a really good spring, whose velocity has ticked up. It seemed to tick up in Buffalo at the end of last season. Um, you know, he was expected when he was with the Dodgers that he was going to be one of their good young pitchers. It didn't pan out when he came over to the Jays. But if he's throwing 97 and he had a good outing his last one uh, of the Grapefruit League season, he's a guy that can, uh, if you if you got a short outing from either Francis or Gosman, he can pick it up and, and go as far as he can, maybe three, four innings. And that's why... The other spot, if you've got Swanson and Romano both out, 
I would give to Yariel Rodriguez, even though they want him to be a starter uh, eventually. The fact is that his money is guaranteed when he signed his free agent contract. So you can bring him in and, and you've got four years of Yariel Rodriguez. Uh, you could bring him in to start the season um, as that second long man and, and expect that if it's not Francis or Gosman that's going to go short in his start, somebody else might. It might be Bassett. It might be Kikuchi, who hasn't looked that great. But, yeah, I mean, Romano and Swanson are both one-inning guys who replace them with uh with guys that can give a little length and it's it shouldn't work out that badly and you and i discussed on an earlier program um who would be the closer if romano wasn't able to go and at the time he was healthy but who did we decide would be able to do that why well, I, I i volunteered chad green just, yeah just, just i think I... yeah i think we agreed that that and and Jimmy Garcia has been outstanding in the games that uh, that I've seen on TV. Um, so yeah, there are options there, but as important is what we're talking about: guys that can give you a little length. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, they come out of the gate here with some injuries, uh, or with injuries or fatigue that that have caused delayed starts. They're they're not at full strength as they break camp here, Griff, and there is no rest for, for the not even weary yet. <laughs> you know, I would say no rest for the weary. Well, they're not even weary yet. And Tropicana field. I, I, I think the Rays are, we, we talked about the AL East. I, I don't think the Rays are anything to sniff at this year, but of, of course, annual predictions of their demise are always greatly overrated. And we know that as John Gibbons like to, to say, hey, House of Oars, you know, the, the trop is a House of Oars, you know, something always happens. Brad Lincoln walks the world. And the House of Oars, you can't walk the world. You know, that, so so stuff can happen at the trop. Then you got Houston and then you got the Yankees and what will be their season opening home series, uh, their first home series of the year. So it's a tough road trip. Out of the gate, second time that they're doing three series on the road in a row to begin a year because of the of the uh, upgrades to Rogers Center, the renovations. So they want to buy a little extra time for those. You know, you're going in slightly undermanned from a pitching perspective. Uh, down two of your top relievers, three pretty good opponents. If you can come out of this, and I know Jays fans aren't going to want to hear this, but if you can come out of this five and five, hell, I'll even give them four and six. If if you can get home around the 500 mark, smile. And if you're above that, hell of a trip. Hell of a trip. Yeah, I, I think that it's it's pretty much a break that they begin the season in Tampa. Um especially with, since we both agree that this isn't going to be, you know, this might be the the window slamming on Kevin Cash's fingers of contending because they've done it just on a wing and a prayer most years. Um, but this might be the year that they don't. And, and the Jays opening there, um, not having to travel too far, being able to have guys go back and forth between the, the complex and the trop, even though they're going to be based at a hotel in St. Pete, the usual hotel they go to, the Vinoy. Um, I think that it's a break for them to open in Tampa, and I would say two and two or three and one would be the only result that I'd be looking for. Vinoy is a pretty good place. Yeah, it's a pretty good place. Stayed at the Vinoy a couple times on those trips. Whenever, whenever, whenever I had like enough points or I could sort of sneak a nice stay in, I always, I always made sure that the Vinoy was targeted. Yeah, I, on I, that, on that I loop. only, I only stayed there when I was working for the Blue Jays because that's their team hotel. Right. But I didn't. It was too big. The property is too big. It's too lavish. Is there's too much going on. So I stayed at the uh, the Ponce de Leon in downtown St. Pete. Every room was art deco in a different style. Is that uh, a Marriott or no? No, no it was, well, you're not it was, a Marriott. Were you a points points guy like the rest of us or uh, no? I, I evolved into that. 
but I wasn't or didn't or start default. out that way. <laughs> In fact, at one time I was the one of the top 20 Radisson Point guys until Radisson okay. kept calling me and harassing me about being a doctor who didn't check into Boston when I should have. I was a Dr. Richard Griffin and and like they wouldn't leave me alone. So I said, baseball. yeah, take two and hit to right. Um, but yeah, so that, that's enough of the Tampa opening and the Tampa situation, which isn't even in Tampa. It's in St. Pete. But um, yeah, I think they could come out of there three and one. I mean, you, you think of the Rays coming to Toronto last year, they were undefeated, weren't they? 12 and 0, 13 and 0, something like that. Yep, and, and the Jays uh, wrecked that. Kikuchi and Barrios back to back shut them down. So I'll tell you right now, Griff. You know, Barrios bounced back really nicely last year. So this is less about him and more about the impending free agent. You say, man, like need ya. Need ya. Need ya here early in the season. You know, he he was good last year. And you and I would laugh on the on the episodes we do because you knew that deep down I I wanted to I wanted to poke the balloon and let the air out a little bit. It's like we're still having some whiplash here. Okay. You know, we're still looking over our shoulder at the bombs that are that are being hit. Okay, the walk totals are down. That's that's good. He had a good year. Um, I would still be more comfortable if he was my five. If I'm being gracious, four. He is very much the three to begin the year, and he may have to be for the first little bit. Like, they need him to get out of the gate good. In uh, in John Schneider's office, before the All-Star break, I just was being a smart ass. And when you he never when he announced that uh, Vlad was going to be in the home run derby again, I said, is he taking Kikuchi to throw? <laughs> and the room was full of writers. <laughs> and even Schneider laughed and he shouldn't have. Was this two years ago or last year? Oh, no. Two years ago, you were still with the team. Yeah. So it's, yeah I wouldn't it's, have asked this past year. Two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but early in the season, he was still giving up the bombs, you know. Kikuchi. Right. But he turned it around. And and this spring, he didn't have a very good spring training, but I think he was working on a, an extra pitch. And when you're doing that, sometimes you throw it in a situation that you wouldn't in the regular season, and sometimes it doesn't work. But you're not concerned about it. So he may have found out some things that he's not going to carry into the season about when and when not to use his new pitch. He may even uh, sort of dump it. But, yeah, I wouldn't be that concerned until I see uh, three or four starts worth. But they do, have a good, they do have a good rotation, though. Well, especially if they can get everybody healthy and going. Like if Gosman is built up to 100-plus pitches by start three, start four, and there are no setbacks. And Bowden yeah, Francis I mean has to be better than an early season uh Alec Manoa which is not going to be difficult that's a low bar I know and if that happens and and then Manoa if he can get back to pitching in Florida or at Buffalo and sort of it gives you depth it gives you uh and then Tiedemann looked great his last few outings I was going to bring I don't think he's up. there's any chance he's going to break camp or be up there early agree with you so I was I I was going to play the over-under game with you on Ricky Tiedemann. Over-under. Ricky Tiedemann's Major League Baseball debut date, June 1st. Over-under. Wow. I was going to, and of course, a lot of it depends on uh, health. Uh, yep. Not his health, but health on the current team. Rotation. Yeah. But I, I was, in my mind, while you were asking that question, I was saying late May, the last 10 days of May. So I'm going to go under. Well, Dude. the reason, Griff, I picked June 1 yeah. is because Alec Manoa made his major league debut in the second to last week of May, was it, at Yankee Stadium yeah. in 2020. 
Right. And the reason the reason for that is yeah. that if you go to the second half of May, then you get a player for a seventh year because or the arbitration, he doesn't get his arbitration um, because you he's he won't be in the top two thirds of two. No, I, I get it. Like, yeah. But and but yeah. So that's why I was was starting with mid to late May. But what I'm wondering, Griff, is is it. You know, you talk about arbitration and eligibility and your service time and and all of yeah. that. You can bring a guy up and option him back too, right? Correct. Right. Yeah. You know, but get... the, I guess I guess the fear, which is a ridiculous way to put it, but the fear would be is that he comes up and he's so good that you can't send him back. But then there's also this need to really protect Tiedemann because he didn't throw a lot of innings last yeah, year. Yeah. Well, that's that's the main thing. The summer is... suffering with biceps tendonitis yeah the over june 1st would be as a protection protective measure against the reaching his innings limit too soon i mean we, we've talked about david price and the way he came up for the the rays when they went to the postseason he came up as a rookie and and dominated out of the bullpen he wasn't a starter in the playoffs but he also didn't come up till mid-season and and that would be the role if this team is going to contend that I would see for Ricky Tiedemann as a possible late season addition and a long guy out of the pen like David Price was uh, in that run that the Rays had to the World Series. Uh, it is Monday evening, May the 25th, as we bring you the 12th episode of season two of the Exit Philosophy podcast, GriffsThePitch.com is the website you can go to for all of Griff's work, his columns. Uh, his MLB power rankings, and he's kickstarted those again. And, of course, the uh, conversations that Griff has with uh, current and former Blue Jays and former Montreal Expos as well, and those are all archived. Uh, highly, highly recommend. If you're new to the site, take some time and just go through them over the coming weeks and 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 months. Griff has just dropped a column. And it is, has it really been dropped until it's tweeted out? Uh, no. well, but by the time by the time someone's listening to this, it will right. be tweeted out. Yeah. So I should probably just, you know, I, I can tweet. Sometimes... I can tweet bef- quicker than we can edit this. <laughs> that's an excellent. That's an there excellent point. Excellent point. So you've got a you've got a column out literally now uh, that uh, profiles the bench decisions that the Blue Jays have made. So thirteen and thirteen, right? Thirteen position players and. Uh, 13 pitchers to start the year. The four bench players, Brian Servan, the catcher, and that's because Danny Jansen is out right now with the broken hand. So Kirk and Servan are the two catchers on the opening day roster. Ernie Clement, no surprise, out of options. Babe, David Schneider. Duke. He makes the team. Schneider. What's that? I prefer Duke. Duke, Duke Schneider. Duke, Duke Schneider. Duke Schneider. I like that. I like that. And Daniel Vogelbach. There's a surprise. Unfairly, That's surprising. Unfairly written off by us. Yeah. Exit that... philosophy. But if I could just say to Daniel Vogelbach, you've never taken a shred of advice from me before, and you're never going to take a shred of advice from me again after this. So just bear with me if, if, if you're listening, which you're not, but if someone gets this to you, you'd better have a three home run game in the first week of the season, because I am on board with your idea, Griff, that if Joey Votto can get ramped up and can be in the home whites to stand on the third base slash left field line, for home opener introductions, they will find a way to make that happen. Number one. And number two, and I know that there are outs, and Vogelbach's a veteran, and and if they try to send him to Buffalo, he can say no dice, and he's a free agent. But you stand a better chance if you have an agreement with the player to push him through waivers after opening day than you do when everybody's getting waived, when the roster cut down begins and you risk having them grabbed. But as soon as they have no room for Daniel Vogelbach, he become, he will become a free agent. There's no way he's going to Buffalo because they've got Spencer Horowitz there. They've got 
other guys that are trying to make their way to the major leagues. And and Daniel Vogelbach is looking to stay in the major leagues, to be in the major leagues. He probably has no interest in playing in Buffalo. And I would suggest that as soon as there is no room on the major league roster, which may happen sooner rather than later, as, as we've discussed, because Joey Votto, they wouldn't assign Joey Votto after Vogelbach unless – because it's the same player. It's the same first base DH, um, which Vogelbach doesn't pl- really play first base. He's sixth on the depth chart of first baseman on this Blue Jays team. And Joey Votto at least plays the position as well as DH. Joey Votto can run the bases on his own. He doesn't need somebody to pinch run for him necessarily. There might be certain situations where – or Ernie Clement might come in to pinch run if it's a key eighth or ninth inning situation for Joey Votto, but it's going to happen every time with, uh, with Vogelbach. And I don't see the, the peripherals that we have outlined with Joey Votto, the, the benefits of having Joey Votto on this roster that, that translate to Vogelbach. They don't. Yeah. And, and this, we, guy, this guy is taking up one of four, bench spots and all he can do is hit an occasional home run or an occasional extra base hit which would have to be all the way to the fence so he can get to second yeah yeah i mean he's he is he is a threat off the bench against a plus right-handed reliever late in the game when you've got a righty righty matchup that you don't like that that's unless unless of course he's getting some dh at bats, which is possible, but that would mean Justin Turner's playing third and et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of sort of jigsaw puzzling that, that, that has to go for all that. I, I don't, I don't see it Griff, but again, we got to remind ourselves of the very thing that we say, which is opening day rosters. Right. Can change that, almost immediately. We make it, more of these decisions than, than, it, than need be made. In 2023, the Blue Jays used 46 players, and the opening day roster is 26. So clearly, over the course of 162 games, there's going to be a need for more players. And what you see on opening day, as you just pointed out, is not what you're going to see. Um, When Justin Turner is not DHing, the plan was, or should be, that that DH spot is being used to give Vlad or George Springer or Bo a day off their feet and keep their bat in the lineup. That should be the 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 way that the DH is used, not to give Daniel Vogelbach some at bats against a uh, right-handed pitcher, and and then that takes Turner out of the lineup unless you're going to play him at third base, which is a possibility. But there's just no need or room for Daniel Vogelbach. But he's on the team on opening day, so. Yeah, well, you know, you know that there are some tough righty relievers in Tampa Bay. You know that uh, Houston's got pretty good bullpen as well. So, I mean, maybe he maybe he serves a function in the early going to at least. But as you said, he better perform early in the season because yeah. it will be a short leash going forward as soon as Joey Votto gets his at bats and gets his ankle back in order and. And uh, they make sure that they've fired the guy who left the bats on the dugout floor in Clearwater. By the way, if you're watching at youtube.com slash exit philosophy, um, it's the old lighting issues. Apparently they don't change in the hotel room. I now look like the phantom of the opera. (laughs) You look good for a while. Yeah, I was good for a while. I keep shifting in my chair to fix the lighting, but it is, of course, I'm an hour ahead of you. So it's getting a little darker (laughs) here as compared to where you are and i think that the natural light is is fading away on me so heading in our direction it's heading in yes the darkness is coming griff (laughs) the darkness is descending darkness on the edge of moncton then the light just came back on again it's it's there you go it's going youtube.com slash exit philosophy if you're listening wherever you get your podcasts a reminder that griff and i do have a youtube page and you can watch us as we speak, and we will select some games throughout the course of the regular season and do live post games, youtube.com slash exit philosophy. When you go, please subscribe, 
and please hit the notification bell so that when a new episode drops on YouTube or when we do go live, you are made aware as it's happening. YouTube.com slash exit philosophy. Any other bench opinions that you've got, Griff? I mean, I know your column is out now at griffsthepitch.com. Servin's a placeholder for Jansen. Clement yeah. is out of options and had a you know reasonably lengthy run at the big league. Yeah, level. I, I think I think Clement is a perfect bench player for this team. I mean, play the fact that he, infield positions. The, outfield, yeah, the fact he that he was out of options sort of made the decision, but he he then proceeded to have a great spring and helped them make the, a legitimate decision, not just that he was out of options, but. Davis Schneider, I'm not so sure, is a good choice for a bench player. If he's going to earn a starting spot, which he has not right now, then all well and good. Keep him on the roster. But as a bench player, he started 22 games at second base in 2023 in his 35 games that he came up. Started 22 games at second base and only played 12 complete games. So they filled in for him in 10 of his 22 starts. And that's not what you want from a legitimate starting player, especially on a team that emphasizes defense. And if you have to bring Ernie Clement in to play second base and then Vogelbach can't play anything but swing the bat, he can't play anything but batter's box, and your backup catcher is just that, a backup catcher, then it seems to me that Davis Schneider, who has far too much swing and miss, he's got a great idea of the strike zone but take away his opening series in Fenway Park and then that 15 game stretch against sub 500 teams where that entire bench group performed and and probably carried the Jays to a postseason berth but you take those away and you got a long stretch of hitless 0 for 32 or whatever you get you have him being replaced in late innings with a lead because they didn't trust his defense um, you know, the catch he made on television that drew a lot of attention. It's like if I'm driving down the highway and, and I'm missing my exit and I screech over and my passenger goes, hey, pretty good driving. No, it wasn't good driving. It was bad driving. It's just that I made the exit, you know, the same way that uh, the, the David Schneider made that catch. His route was not very good, but the result was perfect. Cut so, across some rumble strips on the way yeah, there. Basically, basically <laughs> the left field rumble strips he hit. Yeah, I again, again, Griff. I mean, so, I, so basically, the 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 backup catcher, given that Jansen is not available, was a good choice. The best choice they had, Ernie Clement, was a good choice, and then that leaves two two other players. And to me. This and we talked about it even last year. We talked about the weakness of the the Blue Jays bench last year, and it might be the same situation this year. You know, if there's a long term injury, you better come up with uh, among your starters. If there's an injury, you better come up with a, a plan B. Yeah, and meritocracy is is a a big part of it too. You know, Kevin Biggio figures to get pretty good run against right handed pitchers at the start of this season, right? Great yeah, job. for sure. You know, Definitely. and I like he's I, earned, he's earned it. He's been around since uh, the same period that Bo and Vlad have, and he's hung in there. And he's like he's yeah, he he's on his craft. Yeah, he's an interesting player to me because, like, I don't think anybody thought he was going to be a star the way that you know Vlad and Bo are. But as you said appropriately, because they all came up together, lumped in with that group, and also son of a big leaguer in the very same way that Vlad and Bo are. So a lot of commonalities in that group. I, I'll say this. Kevin will go through two, three, four week stretches where it looks hopeless offensively. And then, and then the year will end and you'll look and he's had 350, 400 plate appearances and there's a 350 on base percentage. Like he's on base 35 ish percent of the time. 
Got as it. ugly as it can look and you don't necessarily want him playing every day and you maybe want to massage the platoons and he doesn't necessarily have a positional home because he can bounce around a little bit infield outfield do some different things for you you look up at the end of the year and it's not 650 700 plate appearances he's not an everyday guy but the numbers are there yeah there's there's highlights there's defensive highlights where you see him in right field at third base at second base and even first base he's he's in some defensive highlights so he works at his craft he works at that part of it but if you're watching the blue jays on television most of the day most of the time most games he gets frustrating to fans who watch him take a pitch down the middle a strike and it could either be strike three or it could get him into a pitcher's count or whatever. And and it's frustrating to watch. But like you said, well, the end result, he'll grind in at bat and he'll draw a walk. Uh, he'll get his fair number of hits. And, and, and like his numbers, he should be a bench player. He'd be a perfect bench player for this group if they had somebody who could start ahead of him. Because uh, his his skill set allows him to fill in for George Springer in right field and and to play a lot of second base and to even play third base if if uh, first I can yeah yeah I mean he's he's ahead of Daniel Vogelbach on the depth chart of playing first base he's one of the five guys ahead of Vogelbach you got 13 players and and your your dh slash first baseman is your sixth option at first base that's not a good sign yeah i'm I'm picturing the jays up 15 to nothing in the ninth inning of like a game this weekend in tampa or tampa bay or houston stick volga back out there at first base for the bottom of the ninth i'd like and then have and then have like jordan alvarez just rip one down the line I want to see him. Uh, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be he, awesome if he just makes a play? Makes Vogelbach, a play. Vogelbach has been with five different teams in the last five years. One of them being the Blue Jays, where he went zero for four. But there's a reason that he goes through that many teams, and it's not personality; it's skill set. It's it's usefulness to a twenty to a thirteen position player roster. And that's why his bag is always packed. And to me, it should be packed in the first 10 if, days of the season. <laughs> you know, some sometimes, sometimes a lot of what works in life is just to do with timing. Like if Daniel Vogelbach was five years older than me and was in his prime in the late 90s, it had worked. It would have worked, right? Diff- it would have worked differently, and I would argue better than it works for him now, just given the era that he's in and the way that the game yeah. is played. Well, I, I would suggest, so important. exactly to your point, I would suggest that uh, back when I was starting in, in baseball and there were 9, 10, and 11-man pitching staffs and the benches were deeper, and you had skill sets. You you could have a guy who just steals bases. You could have a defensive middle infield specialist. You could have a guy swings from the left side, swings from his ass, and hits home runs or nothing. And that would be the role for Daniel Vogelbach back in the day. But now versatility is the key, and he doesn't have it. Okay. So you say they, they split or they take three out of four in Tampa to start the season. Cause we're both down on the raise this year. I'm arguing that a five and five or four and six road trip. When you consider that Gosman's still getting into the groove that uh, Romano and Swanson are not there at the back end of the bullpen, that it's, Tampa Bay, Houston, New York Yankees, it's not an easy trip to start the season. I'd take 500. The next time we do a podcast episode, we'll have watched the series against the Rays, and they'll be headed to Houston. So we'll be four games into it. Where, What do you think their record is when they take the field at Rogers Center 
for game one of their home season, game 11 of the season overall? I, I honestly suggest three and one at the trop. Then they go to the other orange juice place, uh, Minute Maid. And- I, prefer, I prefer calling it Enron, but you, um, you go ahead. You do. You do. <laughs> I say that they have a new manager who's not dusty. I say that they have a largely new bullpen where roles are not as evident as they were. Um, they, they got a deep bullpen, but roles is a key. I say they go two and one in Houston. So they're five and two headed into New York. And if Stroh pitches wow. in that series, they win that game. Uh, not the Yankees, the Jays. So I'd say they lose. I'd say they're six and four coming home. Yeah, okay. I'm going to say they're four and six. And 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 unless they're losing by ten runs every night, I'm not going to complain about. It. I'm, I, I will. Yeah, four and six should be acceptable when they line up on the foul line and the the place is yeah. jammed. That that should be a, a successful now, if, moment. If they I look life, for, yeah. If they look lifeless and they're getting their asses kicked every night, that four and six can right hit you different, right? Sometimes it's old spice, sometimes it's it's dog shit. So you know, like it, it but but I think four and six is is manageable out of the gate. You're more of an optimist than me, which tends to usually be the case. So six and four. Um, but you know what we're not going to do, Griff? We're not going to bet each other on it. No. Actually, we could. We're we're in an area of the world where betting is allowed. So, 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 yeah, so yeah, well, and it's a bet between buddies anyway. But yeah, I'm, but I'm not betting on baseball. And, and, you know, you can bet on football. You can bet on uh, auto racing. You can bet on golf. But I'm not running to my buddy, good. Matt. I'm not running to my buddy, Matt Boyer. Yeah. Well, then. Yeah. For Shohei, and and we're we're recording before he issues his statement, which you believe isn't really going to say anything because it's a it's a pending investigation, right? No, it is. It, it, it's it's an investigation. This is a the Federal Bureau of Investigation is on this Bowker guy, Griff. There is nothing Shohei Otani can say that is not and i include punctuation periods exclamation points semicolons there is nothing he can say oh well, there isn't nothing he can say there's nothing he should say that is not fine tuned and fully scripted by his legal representatives well i because part of the reason they're in this shit is ipe told a story to espn over 90 minutes on tuesday that put Shohei in legal jeopardy, which is why the story changed on Wednesday when Shohei's lawyers got hold of it. No, 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 no. Ipe stole money. We didn't, Shohei didn't wire the funds to, to, to this illegal bookie. The funds were stolen. And, you know, part of it's a federal investigation, California state law, it, there's a lot going on here, and everybody wants Shohei to say something, okay, but like, what do you want him to say? He's not going to imprison himself by telling us something that a federal investigation will reveal one way or another. Yeah, I certainly hope the FBI has in, improved their observational skills because they used to come into the spring train. They used to every spring give a lecture to every major league team and they'd have these guys dressed like Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. from the TV series. They'd come into the clubhouse in West Palm Beach and they would stand there and they would deliver a speech about no gambling. And they'd be standing in front of the March Madness sheet, which was like $50 a sheet for the players. And the players would just be giggling because these guys didn't even notice on the Coke machine behind them is the biggest gambling uh pool going in florida at the time and uh yeah so to me sports gambling by athletes in my 50 years in the game 51 years is is just stand, it's accepted it's it's nfl fantasy which you mentioned it's fantasy football which which is 
Uh, it, it's betting on individual games on a Sunday NFL, college Saturdays, NCAA basketball. But it was never in my observation, uh, except for Pete Rose, with the exception of Pete Rose, it was always other sports and it was always sort of part of the fabric of the clubhouse. And so like this situation with Shohei Otani, I mean, I know that times change and, and you have a pretty, like you're saying that the fact that it's uh, sports betting is not legal in California is a big factor in this. Well, I mean, that setting that aside, you, it's not it's not legal to gamble with an illegal bookie anywhere, but certainly right. not in California. I would argue that it is time for California to join ranks with the nearly 40 other states that have legalized this enterprise. Gambling's, you know, whatever I feel about gambling, I don't gamble, Griff, because, I mean, you may as well just lie me on the couch and jam a, a pick into my vein with morphine and get me hooked on that instead. Because if I if I I'd ipay myself, <laughs> I'd ipay. I'd be down four and a half million dollars in two weeks and just have my eyes rolling into the back of my head. It's not like so much a moral issue for me. It's that I'm aware of my addictive nature, so I just never go down that road. Um, so I mean, would would illegal bookies be curtailed if gambling was legalized? I don't know. I'm I'm assuming that there are some illegal bookies in New York City and in Jersey, you know, places where gambling Jersey was at the forefront uh, after the Supreme Court uh, legalized gambling or at least opened it up for states to legalize gambling outside of Nevada. Jersey was at the forefront. And of course, Atlantic City um, uh, has 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 been a destiny, not so much now, but has been a destination for decades. So, like, uh, what do I think about what do I think about Ipe gambling and falling into a, a a deep hole here? I mean, he's got an issue, he's got an addiction, he's got to get that fixed because it's clearly made a mess of his life. Well, Shohei Otani, if Shohei knowingly walked money to an illegal bookie or if Shohei unknowingly wired money to an illegal bookie now we're into wire fraud separate from the gambling although it's tied in we're into wire fraud we're potentially into tax evasion because if you gamble legally you there's tax document there's documentation that goes with those transactions and you pay tax on your earnings if you earn um so then there's there's so there's a lot of different balls in the air here right now that that are dangerous for otani well there's a couple of things one is the relationship between um a translator an interpreter and a player and major league baseball for the last um i think it's maybe 10 years or, or slightly less has mandated that there be translators available uh, for foreign language players, um, and they're paid eighty thousand dollars U.S. And then anything above that comes from a team. And and there are like Hinjin Ryu's translator was his best friend, confidant, and companion. Like at the All Star break. Um, Ryu's translator would not go home to his family. He would follow Ryu wherever Ryu was going, and they'd spend the all-star break together. And so they were inseparable. And to me, Ipe is not gambling without Shohei Otani knowing about it. Like, And the problem, as you pointed out, is that the original story changed to a different story so espn had one story and then as you point out the as soon as um a legal firm a lawyer got involved on behalf of otani and his group they said no you can't say that because it puts you in jeopardy it puts you in deep trouble and so, hey, wired money to an illegal bookie yeah for the tuesday story that if told espn whether he whether it was to cover Shohei's own gambling debt 
through IPE or not isn't relevant. It's the wiring of the funds to the illegal bookie. That's a problem, right? And so they had to change the story. Well, in, in hindsight, uh, I wish I had known that about California because uh, when I was with the Expos, I was sort of in charge of, I was the money man. I would hold the money from all the pools. It was like a master's pool, U.S. Open pool, March Madness. I didn't hold that money, but I, the, the, the Indy 500, there's an Indy 500 pool and we were in San Diego and the old, the old configuration of the San Diego Stadium uh was that it was a Fenway Park like wall that height 30 feet behind the bullpens and Ken Maka was the bullpen coach that one year and three hour time difference the I was holding the money it was like 50 times 30 uh and and Ken Maka won the pool and because of the three hour time difference the game was going on so I generously had the money in an envelope and I went out above the bullpen and I said, mock, mock, I yelled down and he looked up. I said, you won the pool and I dropped the envelope, but I hadn't sealed it. So all of a sudden there's like 50s and 20s fluttering down 30 feet and everybody in the stadium's looking over there. I don't even know if the TV cameras got it, but like it's it was like a Wall Street uh celebration a parade it rained it rained. Parade. I mean, it, rained. it never rains in san diego <laughs> they don't even have tarp you made it rain and then i very sheepishly had to walk back to the press box where everybody had seen it and i go oh just a pool just just the indie pool that's all pay, pay no attention to that man <laughs> walking in the concourse yeah that was that knowing the strict california gambling laws i might have been in serious trouble if people had been paying attention <laughs> And the other one was uh, when I had a bleeding ulcer in Florida and Debbie, my wife, was taking me to the hospital, the emergency room. Ron McLean, the trainer, was there. I was on a gurney at spring training and they were taking me in. And I said, Debbie, Debbie, I said, if I don't make it, can you give this March Madness pool sheet to Ron Hansel, who was running the pool? <laughs> and she was so mad. She was so mad at me. <laughs> if I don't make it. If I don't make it, can you give, give my pool sheet to Ron this Hansel? This <laughs> March Madness sheet to Ron. I didn't win. Love you, honey. <laughs> In any way, I didn't win. <laughs> By the way, a bleeding ulcer does not sound like a whole lot of fun. No, it, it was more, I thought it was stress, but it was more diet. So it was like, um, I don't know, beer, much beer every night and greasy fast food. That was okay. probably what did it, you know? That'll do it to you. Yeah. All right. There you go. Yeah, I, you know, I, I just with, with, with Shohei Griff, um, there's a lot of talk about Pete Rose. My my first thought was about Pete Rose. And if if this is something where baseball ultimately has to forgive Shohei, then they're going to have to forgive Pete Rose. Now, one thing that has not come out, so I'm not implying that it happened, but one thing that has not come out is any indication that Ipe bet on baseball. And he insists right. that he did not well I, now, that, that's the, my point is that gambling in in sports clubhouses is accepted and routine right but baseball is verboten and and that should be punished right and my and my my follow-up to that is it doesn't matter what Ipe says the fbi will uncover the truth here and if he did bet on baseball then there's a real problem. Now, I know the league has launched its own investigation. It did so on Friday. Then there's a real problem. And wouldn't it be interesting? Because Shohei Otani Griff transcends the sport. Shohei Otani, you know, you and I, like we've all kind of used the Babe Ruth comparison. I've pivoted off that in the last year or two. Where it's like, yeah, he, yeah, he's kind of Babe Ruth, but he's also different because Babe Ruth stopped pitching 
when he went to the Yankees. You know, Shohei Otani isn't pitching right now because of a second Tommy John, but intends, as far as we understand, to pitch again when able to for the Dodgers starting next year, if possible, and going forward beyond that. I would, like say, there's guy, a, I would say there's a lot of pressure on him to pitch because of the money he signed for. Of the money. So so my point being, like, he, he yeah, he's Babe Ruth, but he's also a little different. He he's He's the biggest star in this sport and i would have to believe as a matter of business practice unless it's so egregious it can't be repaired that baseball is going to have to find in itself somehow some way to forgive otani if this is the worst case scenario if baseball has been bet on which if it has been will be revealed by the FBI investigation. It won't be because Ipe said he did or he didn't. Yeah. Goodness. Yeah. Like, we're not listening to Ipe here for the truth. He may be telling the truth, but we don't know that, and we should not default and defer to just simply accepting his words at this point. So if it's a really ugly scene, wouldn't it be wild if Peter Edward Rose Sr. ended up reinstated because baseball couldn't have a double standard in forgiving Shohei if, underlining if, this is the worst case scenario, forgiving Shohei and yet leaving Peter on the permanent band list. Well, I mean, all you got to do is look back to the 1919 uh, White Sox, uh, the Black Sox scandal, um, how they brought in Judge Landis as commissioner, and very little known is is that Ty Cobb, the commissioner, forced Ty Cobb to leave his team, the Tigers, and go to another team because he was gambling in that previous job. So there are ways of of sort of progressing and quietly changing. I mean, you look at Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle. They're greeters at a casino in Atlantic City. I believe it was Atlantic City. It might have been Vegas. And the commissioners, Commissioner Kuhn suspended them from anything to do with baseball and then turned that over because of, of, of reaction and because of logic that didn't make any sense. So I think that you're on to something. And Pete Rose may be on the road to uh, the Hall of Fame and to forgiveness and not forgiveness, but... But like uh, it, they may have to do something about the Pete Rose situation if they do something uh, to correct Shohei Otani and his ex translator's ex interpreter, his ex best friend. I will I will say on the Rose thing, it would be easier if Pete just wasn't yeah, so yeah no he's yeah willingly he... and overtly seedy decades later. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, like it's like, dude, if you just sort of been humble and not been a spectacle, like showing up to all these autograph conventions and signings and just like if you just sort of then maybe. But like, so I, I kind of say this half in jest, but I, I have to think it would be a consideration, Griff, if this is a worst case scenario with Shohei. And look, you know, he reads a statement. Great. If you think he should have said more, you simply don't understand that there is a, like last I checked, you don't mess with the FBI. I I could be wrong on that. I mean, maybe you want to try. I don't think it's going to go well for you. But the FBI is investigating, baseball is investigating. The statement is is just going to be legal drivel. No questions. I, I And look, what's he hiding? or any of the other reactions one could have, because I'm owed the answers right now. He's not putting himself in legal jeopardy. Goodness gracious, we have to understand that this will come out in time, and the FBI will, the FBI doesn't care who Otani is, or what he does for a living. You know, and they're after this bookie. You know, it, it's all going to come out, because the FBI is involved. Yeah, and social media these days demands immediate answers and, and is filled with conspiracy. And when Pete Rose was going through his problems with Bart Giamatti 
1987, 88, 89, there was no social media. And, and I think if there was, it would have been a completely different situation. Um, but yeah, social media complicates the Otani Ipe situation uh, with legal gambling complicates that situation. Like in some states and other states, it's not. Um, yeah, so it, it's an it's a whole different ball game uh, in this situation. But demanding explanations and the truth on social media or from regular media isn't going to help the situation. It has to be. It has to go through the process and and with legal with the fbi as you point out um so we'll see we'll just have to wait and see there's no use uh, angsting over it let's just uh play ball and enjoy the 24th season uh we're an hour in so let's let's save and i'm not going to change my list you don't change yours we'll make that promise let's save our mvp and cy young picks for next week's episode yeah, I think uh, four games into the season isn't going to change anyone's opinion on on that. So we'll do that. We'll we'll especially, have that up high. Yeah, we'll have that up high with my, next week. Especially with my Cy Young list of fifth starters, Griff. They won't even have pitched by next week. <laughs> <weekend. laughs> but you'll be you'll be back in Toronto then. So I uh, you might change your mind. That might be your Moncton sheet that you've got in front of you there. Well, it, it it isn't necessarily that I'll have changed my mind. It's more likely that I will have left the sheet in the hotel room because in I had the dark. A, in in the dark. The Phantom of the Opera must depart now. I, YouTube.com slash exit philosophy if you want to know what we're talking about. I've been fighting this darkness with it can't get the lighting right, but it's, it's the whole thing. Uh technology is not is not my friend. Uh, but Thursday is opening day, Griff. Major League Baseball season is kind of officially underway with the Dodgers Padres splitting the uh, two game series in Seoul, Korea, that was, of course, overshadowed uh, by uh, Ipe Mizuhara and the allegations against him and the involvement or potential involvement of Shohei Otani. Um, by this time next week, all teams will have a series under their belts. So, a uh, happy new year. Happy baseball season, and we can't wait to break down the Jays Rays series in our next episode. Thanks, Scotty. Thanks, everyone, for listening and uh, play ball.